Good evening, I'm Dave Mitchell, one of the pastors here at Calvary Church in Santa Ana. And so welcome once again to our ongoing weekly series through the book of 1 Peter. And the theme of 1 Peter that I've chosen, the key word is hope. And if you go back in the course of time in the catalog of previous sessions, you'll see hope is, is a constant theme. It's a thing that Peter starts out with. He wants to give the believers hope. They're in a very unfortunate situation where they're suffering, there's hardships that are taking place. Uh, an area that we today call Turkey and the Roman government is being cruel. Nero is coming up and uh, as I talked about last week, uh, is gonna be very, very harsh against the believers, trying to blame them for everything that's going wrong in his administration. And so the whole idea of hope, we come to the final chapter. And the final chapter is 1 Peter chapter five and it's a hope in leadership. Let me read the text and uh, go through verses one through uh, about 10. And it says, therefore I exhort the elders, and that's why it's talking about leadership. He's talking to all the believers, now he's talking to the leadership of the believers uh, that are there in that church. It says, therefore I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, so he's coming alongside as a partner with them, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd, and again, Peter's, all of his credentials are just sort of summed up in that one little verse. It says, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising authority, uh, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the she chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. We'll stop there, and the last few verses I'll finish up in a shorter session next week. And so this is the key. It's interesting. You know, he brings up Satan and his adversarial attacks when he talks, talks about leadership. And I think that there's, uh, you know, he, Satan loves to attack everybody, but particularly if he can get the elders, he can get the leaders, he can get the, the, the younger men that the elders are trying to mentor, if he can attack them and blow up their faith and blow up their reputation with the kinds of things that uh, we've seen in the world over the last few years, we've seen it in a number of churches, uh, then he's really, really able to have impact upon a larger population than just taking one or two believers that are uh, sort of walking away from the Lord that don't have the leadership role. So that's just part of a little coordination there of why he's talking about Satan here. But he's talking to them as they are shepherds. Uh, it's interesting that uh, we are referred to as sheep. Jesus would say he looked over the city of Jerusalem. They're like sheep without, they look like sheep without a shepherd. Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, uh, wonderful chapters that talk about shepherding the flock of God, the nation of Israel. And he really takes to task the shepherds in those days, that is the spiritual leaders, for their failure to be properly shepherding the people. And so it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a metaphor that we constantly see that is used, that the shepherd and the sheep carrying out their role Jesus being the good shepherd, we'll see him here, he is called the chief shepherd, and so it is certainly uh, an, an apt analogy. Now, I read from Philip Keller when he wrote about sheep. He says this, it is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose, they require more than any other class of livestock, endless attention and meticulous care. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sheep, and so I know that that is the, the case for a lot of animals, but it's certainly for sheep who really need leadership in their lives. It's interesting, even in, uh, as I was thinking about it, in Psalm 23, it says the shepherd will bring 
the sheep to the stilled waters. You know, he leads us in the green pastures. He brings us to the stilled waters. The word stilled waters there means waters that have been stopped. Waters where the, the flowing river is going along and the shepherd will dam up part of that stream to make stilled waters. So why does the shepherd need to bring stilled waters and the sheep to that particular location? It's because sheep are not smart enough to be able to manage flowing water. If they try to get close enough to drink out of the water, their wool may absorb some of that water and they could be sucked away and, and uh, dragged down that river bed or that stream bed. So the, the shepherd will still the waters so that the sheep are able to drink from the quietness of those stilled waters and not risk losing their lives. So there's, there's a, lot, a lot of analogies and the point, the point being that God is our shepherd, Jesus is our shepherd and he wants to make sure that we are living as we should because on our own devices, with our own value systems, with our own personal will and selfish desires, uh, we can be like sheep that go astray. Even Jesus, the 99 sheep and the lost sheep, sheep in Luke chapter 15. So there's so much of that where we need to be very careful where, where the shepherds are leading us. So this is a message to the shepherds. This is a message to those in leadership, uh, those that would rule over the church and in this particular case, it's the elders of the church. So I'm going to talk about some of the things, uh, a number of R's. I alliterated this one. But first of all, the role of the shepherd. And there's an outline, of course, on, online. Be able to download that. And you can see and follow along as to where I'm going. But notice some of the observations that I make about the role of a church leadership. Just some basic things here, very simple to see. Uh, they are people that relate to people. They're, they are, as he says here, the elders among you. Elders are not some distant person that I never meet and don't know. Shepherds or elders, uh, presbyteros is the word for elder, those who are in positions of leadership are those that are among us. They relate to us. They, they connect with us. We connect with them. They serve as a team. There's no single leader. It says, I exhort the elders plural among you as your fellow elder. Uh, there is a team effort. Now I say that because uh, in my world of being in the church for a long time, I know that there are churches that are, that are elder run and there's maybe one elder that is in charge and everybody else serves that one elder. There are those teams that believe that there should be a singular elder and then everybody else is, is, I don't know, a deacon or are those who are in places of servanthood. And sometimes uh, there are churches where the, the big star, sort of a celebrity pastor is sort of known as the elder. He's sort of the CEO of the church. There's that singular, powerful leadership role. And we've seen over the last five years at least, uh, a number of those that sort of have reached that celebrity status because of their international or national fame, books they've written, seminars they put on, church leaders go to hear from them in their big church. And uh, as soon as that big celebrity pastor fails, uh, there's an infrastructure that begins to crumble. So the key is, and what I love about Calvary Church is that we have fellow elders, we have a team of elders. Uh, and I've said even over the years that I've been here, when I was an elder, uh, that I'm never smart enough to do this job on my own. Uh, I need a team of excellent people who bring wisdom, who are like iron sharpening iron. Sometimes we hear things from the elders that we don't want to hear, but it's things we need to hear to help us to grow. So there's that, that, that fellow uh, elder team building that is necessary. So uh, maybe that's enough said about that, but they serve as a team. And we should never have just a single leader that we all look to, unless it's, of course, Jesus Christ. That's why, I, you know, I jokingly say that there is only one true shepherd. It's the, uh, Jesus himself is the chief shepherd. He is the senior pastor, if you will, and we're all under his rule. But he does delegate to us the opportunity to serve here. They're committed to an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It, I feel like you shouldn't have to say that, but I, I do know of elders. I was in a church uh, way back when my seminary days in a city in um, Texas, I won't even name the city, and uh, remember in the bathroom where one of the elders of the church came in and says, you know, the good book says those, God helps those who help themselves. And there was sort of a spiritual vacuum of certainly biblical knowledge, God never said that, uh, but uh, that, that I saw within the 
these elders simply did not have a connection with Christ that is talks about here. He says, I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Peter was intimate with Jesus. He, he suffered with Christ. It is said that he's crucified upside down on a cross because uh, he didn't feel it fitting that he should be crucified the way Jesus was. But not only just the sufferings of Christ, but the glory of Christ. He saw the glory of Mount, Tr Mount Tr of Transfiguration of, of Matthew 17. There he saw this radiant glory of Christ. So he had this, this level of, of connection with Christ that is something that most of us probably don't have, but it's something we strive for, to have that kind of fellowship. So obviously it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. But they should be mature. They should be mature in. There's no one perfect. We all fail. But they are in a maturing process. The trajectory of their faith is growing closer and closer to Christ. That is what we want in the role of a, of a leadership or an elder. Now the rule of the elders, uh, to watch over the needs of the church. Uh, the shepherd the flock, he says, of God among you exercising oversight. So there is an oversight of the elders that here at Calvary Church, and I think for every uh, church in particular uh, should have this, to watch over the needs, to, to uh, have this oversight. Now, one of the turn of phrases that I love to use about Calvary is that we are a staff run built elder rule church. The staff runs the church. There in Texas, for example, when I was at Dallas Seminary, there was churches down in Houston that were elder run churches. One elder has a you know, 40, 50, 60 hour work week and then he comes in and tries to rule the church and run the church. He, he can't do that. He has oversight. So all of us on staff, the senior pastor, Eric Wakeling, he is under the rule and rules with a team of elders who give oversight to the staff and allow the staff to run the church. It says delegation of that responsibility. They have the final authority, but uh, we can't be checking in with our elders every day to see what we should do today. And so the whole idea is to give oversight. The word for shepherd there is the word poimen. It is the uh, Greek word for shepherds. And I uh, let me point out here on Ephesians 4.11 because we've gone through a little change here at Calvary Church where Women are now called pastors, and the key is this. I've written a whole article about this, if you'd like to read more in greater detail about that. But the idea of a pastor in those days, is only, there's only one time the word poimen for shepherd is translated pastor, and that's Ephesians 4.11. Every other time, like in this particular passage here, it's, it's uh, translated as shepherd. And it's interesting because we don't live in a sheep-shepherd sort of <laughs> culture today. Uh, but it's still the term that is used predominantly in Scripture to describe those in leadership roles. There was nothing particularly uh, male or female about the word poimen. Uh, it's just used of those who shepherd. Now, admittedly, the elders of the church in 1 Timothy 3, the elders here probably, are all men. But there's nothing that says that it has to be a male uh, position. And so uh, there's a certain freedom. And even the word pastor... Uh, has taken on sort of a connotation of something more than maybe what uh, a shepherd generally would be considered because shepherds in those days tend to be little kids that would lead the sheep and uh, not these uh, austere, very mature, uh, educated individuals. And so uh, we've made it into a sort of a bigger thing and maybe that's okay, but I just want us to be very careful uh, that we don't uh, maybe misuse it in another direction uh, that God had never intended. So the whole idea is that we need to have people who are in leader, leadership positions, and the key is that they are acquainted with the sufferings of Christ, they are engaged with the glory of Christ, and so they have this kind of a maturity, this depth of faith that carries them over some of the obstacles and challenges in life. So the rule is to oversee the church, and they are to be volunteers, to volunteer eagerly by God's will and not for personal gain. Uh, all of our elders, except for one, uh, Eric, uh, is a volunteer. Uh, they, are, they are not for sort of gain. There, there's nothing in it for them. But even those of us on staff, we're not driven by the financial ends. And there are some pastors that are, candidly, that are driven. That I've known them, and obviously I won't say who, but there is this, this tendency to be driven by funds and money and let that become the driving motivation. Uh, in our case, that I don't see that happening here at Calvary at all. But it's a volunteer position, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, 
but with eagerness. So we want people that eagerly want to serve, that have this passion to do, to do this, and uh, are driven by the power of God that he would lead them to that. The rule is also to serve as an example, to be godly and mature. They don't domineer over people, not lording it over those allotted to your charge. Not lording it over. Um, boy, there's a tendency, and I've known of churches where the senior pastor or the elders, they are this autocratic system. And uh, it is not this humble shepherd like Jesus who washes the feet of Judas and Peter who are going to betray them in different ways. Uh, rather, it's this uh, rather austere, autocratic leader. That is not according to biblical design. So we need leaders that uh, have this godly maturity, examples to the flock, but not to rule over us. It's interesting, this word allotted, I just uh, would note this, the word allotted, uh, the Greek word for allotted is kleros, K-L-E-R-O-S. We get the English word clergy from that. So the whole idea of a clergyman, I am a clergyman in the eyes of some people, uh, depending upon their denominational background, but the idea of a clergy one is one who has an allotment of people over which he sees and provides, uh, you know, this uh, responsible leadership role. And so this is, this is what God has called us to. Hebrews 13, 17, 7 says this, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Uh, obviously, we need elders that we can imitate their faith. We need those that we can look to and see Yes, that's how I would do it. In fact, if you think about it, if I'm an elder, I'm a leader in the church, we should be able to say, if all the people prayed the way I prayed, would we be a praying church? If all the people gave to the church the way I give to the church, would we be a giving church? If all the people studied the Word the way I study the Word, would all the people be uh, a faithful student of the Word of God? If all the people worshiped the way I worship, would all the people be truly a true worshiper of Jesus Christ. And so we need those leaders that we can imitate and know that their conduct is uh, honorable and conduct that we would say, yes, that's good for me too. We also see this, that the first Peter 5, 4 says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I love that idea of chief shepherd. The word chief shepherd is only used of Christ. It's never used of somebody like myself or others on our staff here. He is the chief shepherd. That's why, as I said, he's the senior pastor. The word chief arch, it's this, this arching, overruling poimen. Arch poimen is the Greek word actually there. It's actually one word. We make it into two words, chief shepherd. And so it's uh, said of Christ alone. And when we do that, there is a, there is a crown of righteousness that is waiting. An unfading crown of glory, we should say. First, Second Timothy 4, 8, Paul talks about this for his own life. He says, In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So there are crowns. In fact, there's five crowns. I'm not going to go into it here. But there are a number of crowns that are talked about in Scripture, that one goes to the leadership role of those who are in these positions, and God loves to award those and reward those for their faithfulness because he knows how hard it is. Jesus lived this life. He knows how challenging it can be and the satanic attacks that can come. We also see the responsibility now of the church that comes back to the elders. He goes on then in uh, verse 5. He says this to them. You younger men, so there would be maybe those younger men that were potentially elders to be in the church, likewise be subject to your elders in all of you. So this includes every one of us under the rule of the elders, let's say here at Calvary Church, all of you clothe yourselves with humility to, toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. So the whole idea is this humility, this humble attitude towards those in leadership roles. Um, I can just tell you that over the years that I've been doing in, uh, this in leadership roles and the elder role, that they do get a lot of comments, they get a lot of notes, and sometimes they're not very friendly notes. I've seen a lot of those over my years, and uh, we just need to be very careful. Now, obviously, if our elders are not doing all the things they should be in terms of their role and their rule, uh, then there needs to be some sort of uh, responsibility towards them. But key, uh, key in on the fact that we, if we have elders, and I think we have a wonderful group of elders in our church today, that they are godly men who love the Lord, love the church, 
want to help the church be a, everything God wants the church to be, then my role is to respond with an attitude of submission and humility. And even as they would respond to an attitude of submission and humility to the chief shepherd that we just talked about. Hebrews 13, 17 says this about the, uh, us as the congregation. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who are given an account. That's why it's just very challenging to be an elder. I have a higher responsibility in my role that I will be accountable to God for. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And so our role is to simply be humble, but also keep them accountable, as God keeps them accountable, but recognizing that in the spirit of submission to them and understanding that God is working in their lives, maybe in ways that we can't understand fully, or the decisions that they may make, we may not fully understand it because we're not part of the bigger context of discussion that is going on. And then there's the resistance. So we talked about the role, the rule, and the responsibilities. Now there's the resistance. Uh, as I said, leaders are those that Satan would love to attack. Satan, he saved some in, in Matthew chapter 4, some of his strongest attacks against Jesus. If he could take Jesus out before he begins that big public ministry, then he's uh, won the way. But he loves to, obviously he didn't defeat Jesus, but he loves to defeat those of us in leadership roles. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9 says this. He talks about humility. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We need to humbly cast our care to the Lord. Let God be the one who rules over us, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. The idea of anxiety is sort of this double-mindedness where I'm just not sure and it causes anxiety. God says, I want you to be assured. I am your God. I, am, I have a mighty hand under which I want you to live. And so we live under the mighty hand of God because He does care for us. Uh, and so we th sometimes think, you know, the believers here are going through a time of suffering. And it's easy for them to think, where's the God of the mighty hand? Where's the caring ministry for us? And so you see that there's this, this challenge that can come through suffering where I feel like I must have done something wrong or God's not pleased with me. In point of fact, he points out that uh, Satan is the one who loves to cause that anxiety and so therefore I need to cautiously resist the attacks of the devil. He says here, be sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And so he is on the prowl. Uh, he's got his, who many knows how many, hundreds of thousands of demons that are out there, the fallen angels as well. So I, never, I should never think that suffering has to do because of my sin. Now it can be. Uh, there are clearly examples of that, but it's not necessarily the case. Now, what I wanted to finish up with about Satan, there's a whole lot we could say about that, but I just, uh, one of the things that I've loved to have done is, and I don't have the verses written out, but you can look them up. This is on the, on the outline that is there. There are specific verses in the New Testament, particularly, uh, that identify certain challenges, sins, temptations, and aligns it and links it directly to Satan or the devil. And these are the verses that link certain things, certain problems to satanic behavior. And so I just want to highlight those for you. I've talked on this a number of times over the years. For example, in a sense of immorality in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it talks about that, that when a marriage relationship is not as intimate as it could be, it says Satan has an opportunity there. And so immorality of, of failing in the in the relationship of being a, between a husband and a wife. In the sin of anger, it says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, don't let the sun go down in your anger and give the devil an opportunity. So again, devilish behavior is linked to anger that is uncontrolled, unconfessed. In the sin of lying and hypocrisy, we find in Acts 5, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, where they lied, they were hypocrites, they, they presented themselves as giving more than they really were giving. And that particular hypocritical uh, behavior, it says Satan has entered into these people and caused these things. I don't pretend to even understand how that spiritually happens. Uh, and whether they were believers or not, we, we are unclear about that. I don't want to go down that road. But I do know that their lying and their hypocrisy was that satanic behavior in the early church to take out these early church people that were committed there, uh, seemingly doing the right thing, but obviously for the motivation of hypocrisy and selfish uh, desires. 
And so those, those are sins that Satan loves to attack us in. We just need to be aware of that. Uh, there's a lot of other sins, but they're not linked to what Satan does. Now, he may be, but they're not biblically linked. Now, another example is the need of forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, you can read that. There's a whole section there on what it means to forgive someone, to, to love them, uh, to embrace them, and forgive them. The whole idea of forgiveness in 2 Corinthians 2, the word for forgiveness is, uh, is this whole idea of, uh, of giving grace to someone. And then he says there, if you don't forgive this person, this sinful person, probably from 1 Corinthians, if you don't forgive this sinful person, you've given the devil an opportunity. A heart of bitterness and unforgiveness is a heart that is ripe for satanic attack. Now, it's just directly linked there. Uh, unlike other behaviors that we might think about, that one is linked to satanic behavior. And you need to be aware of that. That if I carry this bitterness, there's a uh, satanic opportunity for him. There's also in this uh, misleading, distorted truth or false teaching. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 talks about these sort of these uh, preachers that present themselves as like an angel of light, that they're they are these righteous, wonderful people that we want to follow. But if they're not teaching the Word, if they're not teaching the Word accurately, uh, they can come across in a way that looks very inviting but they are uh, they're agents of Satan. And we need to see that, that this false teaching, this uh, distorted teaching, this under, undermining of the teaching of God's Word is clearly linked to satanic behavior. Sometimes when we have weakness and doubt, uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 had been repeatedly asking God to heal him, three times at least. He did not do that. And uh, it's uh, really an opportunity for Satan to kind of get into his heart and his mind but he turned to the Lord and got strength from God, but it was clearly an, an opportunity or an open window for Satan to be uh, distorting his faith and undermining his faith in the Lord. And you can read that. In anxiety and worry, we talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Cast all your cares on him, your anxiety. He talks about anxiety and casting your cares on the Lord, and then he talks about Satan, because Satan loves to, to, he loves to attack anxious people, because the word anxiety talks about this double-mindedness. This, this sort of this uh, wavering heart or mind, and that becomes somehow, in some ways that are mysterious to me, a way for Satan to sort of undermine our faith, and particularly the leaders of the church that were there in that particular context. And then uh, finally, in preventing one from believing the gospel, this is the most, the most difficult one. I pray against this one. Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 talks about how Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might, not li they might not see the gospel, the light of the glory of Christ. Uh, and as you pray for your unbelieving friends and family, you pray that the blindness would be removed and that the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ would penetrate their hearts, that would draw them into His presence. And so these are some very specific ways that we can pray, uh, specific ways that he talks about to be sober-minded, uh, to be alert, your adversary, the devil, be alert to these specific things, these things that I've listed here in the previous page. Be alert that those are some of the avenues that Scripture teaches that Satan has his way of somehow coming into our heart and mind and causing a defeat of our faith. I don't, again, I don't play, you know, the Holy Spirit is in me, so greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So we believe that. But we also know the whole world, 1 John also says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So there's this conflict of the power of the world that is coming upon the power of Christ within us. So we need to have the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit to reign and be supreme and fill us and control us and guide us so that we're alert to the biblical teaching on these matters and can withstand and resist, as he says here, the antics or the tactics of the Satan, satanic attacks against us. So that is the role of leaders, to help us to be resisting those things that are evil, but also to be in submission and supporting and praying for those who are in leadership roles and for those in leadership roles to be people we can imitate, uh, to follow along under their role of leadership. So the hope of leadership, as was found in 1 Peter 5. Thank you for taking part in this. We look forward to sharing the final message last week. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for our elders. Thank you for those men who are willing to step into leadership role and for all the men and women who are in leadership roles here at Calvary Church. God, give us strength and give us power to walk with you faithfully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.